Chapter 22. The Whole Duty. Commences with a quote by King Solomon. He who loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote a sharply insightful book titled When All You've Ever Wanted Isn't Enough. The Search for a Life That Matters. It reads like a commentary on Solomon's Ecclesiastes, but is set in the very modern world of consumerism. Notes inside the cover of my crumbling edition show that I read it in 2000, 2004 and 2009, and that friends and family have also been nourished by it. It is dog-eared, underlined and highlighted and has margins full of personal notes and reflections. Kushner describes the pursuit of pleasure as being like a snowflake that looks so beautiful as it floats to earth, but disappears the instant you try to take hold of it. That's a pretty good pricey of King Solomon's advice too. We can never quite grasp what we need to be fully satisfied. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10 reads, He who loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. The love of money and things is a type of hunger or desire. We will always hunger for more and remain only temporarily satisfied. So, does Ecclesiastes give us any hints on where we can find true satisfaction and meaning? Does it even exist? Solomon warns us about the vanity of labour. In Ecclesiastes 4 verse 4 he says, And I saw that all labour and all achievement spring from man's envy of his neighbour. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. But he also says, seemingly in opposition to his own arguments, that satisfaction can be found in toilsome labour. In chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, he says, Then I realised that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink, and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labour under the sun, during the few days of life God has given him. For this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions, and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. And in chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, he says, I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. He also instructs us to find joy in our food and drink and marriage and work. In chapter 9, verses 7 to 10, he says, Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life, and in your toilsome labour under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for in the realm of the dead where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. So how do we differentiate between the eating, drinking, marrying and working that is just a chasing after the wind, and the everyday activities that are in line with God's will for us? Or is it really all meaningless? Well, that's actually up to us to decide. Every moment. Paul gives us a hint in 1 Corinthians 10.31 where he says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Eating and drinking are not just mundane or vain activities if you're doing them for God's glory. And in fact, this rule applies across all aspects of life. If you want to study, study for the glory of God, and it will be satisfying. If you want to achieve great accomplishments, do them for the glory of God and they will satisfy you. When you work hard, work for the glory of God, not yourself, and the work will satisfy. If you gain popularity and fame, use them for the glory of God, and you will find satisfaction through them. If you earn great wealth, remember that it's not yours. Use it for the glory of God, and you will be satisfied. But how can we do this? Well, as we work and study and accomplish, and live, we need to do it in the presence of God. Acts 17.28 said it well, 
In him we live and move and have our being. We need to practice the presence of God, his literal presence. I'm not talking about wearing a rubber wristband with WWJD on it, or fixing a bumper sticker on your car that reads, Would you still blast your horn if Jesus was your passenger? We need to be aware that we are truly living, walking, talking, vacationing, eating, drinking, working, existing in the very presence of God. You and I only exist and breathe because of his presence. Life as we know it, the very heartbeat of our planet, would evaporate instantly if God's loving presence were removed. So, every success we have, every dollar we make, every applause we receive, every race we win, it all happens in the presence and because of the presence of God. When I learned to live in an awareness of his presence, I began to really live and to be truly satisfied. And in doing so, I realized that I'm actually and literally a citizen of another world. I finally understood the depth of C.S. Lewis's words. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world.